I love that little voice. Hi, everyone. If you haven't been in session A before, I'm Michelle Arnold, the Empire of the Empowering Teaching Excellence Office here at Utah State University. If you have, well, welcome back. We've had some excellent sessions today on, on column A. So if you guys have any questions or concerns about where you can get these recordings or when they'll be available, please contact me and I'll help you do that. For our final session this morning, column A, we have Becky Cash, and she is from uh, Nevada State College. And she'll be presenting, I can't grade another paper, which is something I most desperately need to know more about. Thank you, Becky, and I'm passing it off to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to have you here. There's a couple links in um, the chat, and I noticed that um, there's a few more people coming in, and so I'm just going to go ahead and repost those um, just in case you need them. So one, um, the first one is to the uh, slides that I'll be using today, and then the second one is to uh, a Jamboard. So if you can access the Jamboard, I thought it might be fun to, to start with um, just some thoughts about uh, your feelings about grading papers. And so uh, let me share my screen with you and I'm going to um, show you this Jamboard. And so I use this with my students and I think it fits very well with what I'm going to talk about today. Um, which is visualizing history or visualizing any uh, discipline in which you may teach. And so um, if you would join the Jamboard and uh, maybe start to think about this, I think in terms of songs and art and photographs and books a lot of the time, which is what I'm going to be sharing about. And so um, for me, kind of a drag uh, described how I sometimes feel about grading. So as you're um, thinking about that and, and maybe what song would describe the way that, that you're feeling, um, let me give you just a, a little bit of um, background about um, myself and uh, the presentation. So I have a background in uh, middle school and high school, both English and history. And I had the good fortune um, for the last three years uh, to be teaching at Nevada State College as a lecturer in the history department. I teach core humanities and history classes. Before that, I taught um, five years in uh, Las Vegas Academy, which is our performing arts school here in Las Vegas. And I taught the dual credit program with the College of Southern Nevada. So um, I had um, college level classes taught at the high school level, um, History 101 and History 102. And so that's how I ended up kind of having the background to matriculate um, to the higher education world. And so I brought a lot of um, ideas with me. And uh, some of those ideas, I thought maybe I wouldn't be able um, to uh, to use um, at the college level, um, but I had uh, a few realizations and um, a couple of things that I'll just give you as background before I, I talk about um, the alternatives that I found work for me. First and, and foremost, I had a toolkit that I wasn't sure whether I would be able to, to use in higher education. And so when I first started teaching classes, um, my first 400 level class, I planned four um, research papers for the semester. And I had students in the class that um, had never taken a history class before, were taking it because it fit their cultural diversity requirement. And I had uh, students who were getting ready to graduate. And so that was my, my uh, first year at Nevada State, spring semester. And I did a lot of soul searching after that semester to see how I could better scaffold um, not only um, assignments and assessments to fit the needs of students, but also um, to get to the heart of the research and the historical kind of inquiry and thinking that I wanted them to do. And so something else that I had also been thinking about all this time um, coming out of this high school background was the idea of um, visualizing history. And so I had started and done quite a bit of research and use of infographics um, in, in my uh, last few years teaching at the high school level. And so 
I ended up kind of melding those together and um, realizing that the kinds of strategies that I often use to help students visualize history and make connections to their own lives were just as valid at the higher education level as they were um, in the K-12 world. And so once I got over that hump, then I really started thinking about this, which is why I consider alternatives to a traditional research paper or essay. Are there ways to um, create rigor and to get to the, the heart of the, the research in a different way than just a traditional research paper or essay. And I'm not going to tell you that I, I don't assign those kinds of, of papers because I definitely do still, but um, there is a method in my madness as far as how I, I scaffold um, four main kinds of alternative assessments that I'm going to talk about today. So you'll notice that um, as far as the, there's a couple of things, let me show you the GM board link that, that I gave you. So um, we, we are curating a list here, which is gonna be important when I talk about the uh, playlist and also the curated uh, exhibit. Uh, but I've got some other questions for you that you can look at too. And one is why consider alternatives to an essay or research paper? Um, your curated loves or hates. And finally, just assignment and assessment ideas, because I'm sure that many of you have um, very similar kinds of assessments and assignments, whether formative or summative, that you give throughout the semester as well. So I wanted to, to share those with you. And then just to talk a little bit to start with, I had some very boring slides to begin with about why we assess, how we assess, what we assess, which I'm thinking, I think we're all beyond that. We, you know, we think about that backwards design all the time. We're thinking about assessing um, content and assessing and or process. Um, we're thinking about assessing as far as in a formative aspect and giving feedback and making that part of the loop or in um, a summative way. And so I think that, we, that we're beyond that and can talk about those kinds of alternatives and where they might fit into um, your classroom and your curriculum. So, I think that for me, finding an alternative was a way to still help students synthesize um, information, uh, possibly to collaborate um, at different times, to show their strengths in other ways than just writing about something, although you'll find that there is a written component to all of these assessments that, that I'm going to show you. But students who are differently abled or have some kind of language challenges, often this gives them a component that really helps them understand what they're writing about. Um, I also feel like these four assessments that I'm going to show you can be integrated in different ways and really help with that kind of scaffolding and looping um, for um, scaffolding for students and, and also the feedback that we give them. And I've also started thinking in terms of a larger audience and um, when we think about like undergraduate research and um, how the kinds of um, assignments and assessments that I use help students gather a lot of different kinds of sources together and visualize uh, the answer to a question in a way that might help them produce something that is either a product or um, a paper eventually at the undergraduate level. And of course, at the end, um, there's, a, there's an aspect that I really enjoy. There's uh, an, a sense of excitement and uh, I just, took in um, last night, there was a due date for one of these assessments that I'm going to show you. And so I'm really excited about you getting a, a first glimpse at them. And, and that's the way I feel. I'm always excited to look at the kinds of assessments that I'm gonna share with you today. So I pared this down a little bit and I am going to focus on uh, first the playlist and then an assessment called the one pager the curated exhibit, and then um, finally and very briefly annotated bibliography. And so I feel like for me, I have used these um, 
at since I've been at Nevada State in some way, shape, or form. And I feel like they engage students and they also demand the critical thinking skills that I want them to use. So what I've done is through the presentation, I have examples, of, student examples of all of these. So I have a lot of, I exceeded the word limit on a lot of these pages, just to show you what I have on Canvas and what the assignment looks like for the students. And then um, I also have those student examples and I show you in kind of a scaffolded format. So how I started with the assignment and maybe what it looks like in a 100 level class or in my core humanities class, as opposed to what it looks like in a three or 400 level um, elective course. Okay, so we're going to start with this idea of, of the playlist, which a, a lot of these dovetail, right? The playlist and um, the curated exhibit and, and those kinds of ideas really all go together and speak to um, what our students find out there in, in their world, so the social media kinds of world as well. And so I started this with just using songs. I broadened it to include books, um, art, and film as well. And then the written portion of this is um, Students make a claim, they provide evidence, and then they're analyzing the piece that they have chosen. I start to use this in like singleton ways, performative assessments in discussion. I ask them to choose a song that relates to a theme or topic. I ask them to choose a piece of art sometimes and talk about that, um, especially in the core humanities course. I ask them to um, sometimes choose a work of literature that relates to a theme. And so I'll throw like not a whole playlist at once, but just an element of playlist before we actually get into um, this little bit lengthier assignment. So this is what I started with, one of my first playlist assignments that I gave. This is for a History 102 class. And so I always have an essential question. Either I give them the essential question that I want answered, especially in the lower division courses or in the upper division courses, um, I will give them a guiding question and ask them to develop the essential question. And so you can see here, at first I just started with a five song playlist and I asked them to then um, choose a song for each of the themes within the 1890s. And you can see those, the major themes, African-American life, labor, immigration, populism, and imperialism. And I want to show you um, an example of, sorry, let me switch gears here. Um, I wanna show you an example of a couple of, of student um, assignments that I received. And there's usually a choice with students. I'll, I'll tell them that they can um, use a document or they can use um, you know, slides if it makes it easier for them. But you can see all of the visuals here. And then this student did his narrative kind of as one um, fell swoop, as one shot there. Um, another one of my students uh, did this as a slide presentation and um, then did individual slides for each of her choices that she had. And I will tell you that that's about a 250 plus word paragraph that the students are writing about each of these. So sometimes what I find as well is that students will write more if they have something literally there, they have a picture of it to write about and that they're, and that they're thinking about. Um, so I started with that for my playlist and um, I graduated to uh, this in the same class. And so I broadened this instead of just using music for this, you can see that now they have to use um, a song, a book, movie, art, and then memorabilia. I try to build in my history classes this idea of primary source artifacts and not just written documents. Um, in both the um, history classes as well as the core humanities class. And so now this is a little bit broader. It's still similar to a playlist, but it's also this kind of element of exhibit because it has multiple aspects to it. And so I think that all of these assignments have grown with me as I have grown and changed as an instructor. And so, you know, it's, I think it's very true that the product that students produce is often directly related to the product that we produce as far as the way that the assignment uh, looks and, and is worded. And so 
um, I this has um, gotten some uh, great responses and it shows not only their growth, but my growth as well as far as what I'm asking them to do. So the uh, most recent example that I have of this playlist is one that I just gave in my, I have a cross-listed course this semester. It's um, in environmental history, law and policy, and it's cross-listed uh, with uh, a history course that's a, a special topics. And, and so um, I am using many of the same types of assignments um, and of course, I wondered because I have many more uh, environmental resource science program students, how those um, products will differ and how their thinking might be different. And so this is one that I gave them at the beginning of the semester when we started with talking about the idea of environmentalists versus cornucopians. And so they had to come up with um, four aspects. And I want to show you a couple of the um, of the most recent um, responses to that. And I, I always feel like it's going to be uh, a solid, a productive, a great response if it starts with Miles Davis. And so I wanted to show you this one because of the way that she again used just a document and then integrated her responses with each of the four artifacts that she chose. And she did some um, deep thinking. She has a lot of um, metacognitive type statements where she was able to make connections with the readings and the discussions that we had during the first couple of weeks of, of class. Um, I also want to show you, uh, this is another one that I received from the same class. And again, it's done in a similar format, um, a little bit shorter as far as the responses and the analysis go, but still um, a good analysis and connections, some personal connections. Uh, this student had met this particular artist. so. I think that as I have become um, more adept at explaining what I would like to see in these assignments, the students' products certainly have become um, more sophisticated as well. And so um, that's the playlist that kind of shows the, the my growth and their growth over time as well too with the playlist type assignments from expanding from just music to include other artifacts. I, I want to move on to an assignment now called the one pager. And if anybody wants to make a suggestion on the Jamboard about a better name for this, boy, would I love that. Um, so you can Google up one pagers. They started um, in middle school English, um, probably within the last maybe eight years or so. And they've become this kind of um, teacher phenomenon that they can be adapted to any level, as I have found, and they can also be adapted to any kind of discipline. So it's this, you know, we have one pagers in um, our world as far as selling our majors. We have um, one pagers in the business world. I mean, we call them flyers sometime, right? But that's the idea that we're paring down this information and trying to get students to look at the most salient information, make connections, think visually. It's about connecting the verbal with the visual and um, just thinking about a lot of different ways that they could re represent answers to questions. And so for me, the one pager allows them a lot of choices within a list that I give them. And while I'm thinking about it, um, I would be more than happy to share any of the, re of the resources that I created as far as rubrics and lists that go with that, with any of these. Um, because um, the, the one pager is especially is definitely not mine. It has a life of its own and, and everybody has kind of made it their own, but I'd be more than happy to send you anything that I have that, that helps you see how it could apply to, to your class. Um, so what we do is start with an essential question. And so last semester, I was all asynchronous online and I wanted to create a one pager that related to, to something current. And so I had my students in my uh, core humanities class, which is American experience and constitutional change, 
look at the idea of the mask of a mask mandate uh, if it would be constitutional or not. And so in response to that, um, and let me show you this. But, so this is the uh, a list of requirements. This changes for me depending on the class I'm teaching, depending on the essential question. Um, and you'll be able to see that when I show you the one that I've used most recently in the EMP class because I asked them to include data and or flowchart as far as policy is concerned. And so every one is a little bit different. Um, usually I try to have um, a number that fits with a grading scheme. So I have, depending on the points, if there's 40 points, you know, I might have eight um, kinds of, of requirements for them, I might have 10, but you can certainly make this your own in a way that makes it very easy to then set up a rubric and grade, um, which is more uh, like a checklist. So for this mask mandate, the, these are a couple of examples of what I received. And I wanted to show you these because this is handwritten and digital, and this one is done in a completely digital format. And so I like students to have something that they produced that is has a quality amount of writing on it, but also mixes in those visuals and gives them a chance to make connections. So um, two mainstay requirements as far as the one pagers are concerned would be the claim and evidence and then also the connections that I ask for them to provide. And so they do have to think through an answer to their essential question. It isn't just about um, visuals or poetry or word cloud or you know pictures or photographs. It's this combination so that everything on that page then answers the essential question and tells a story. So um, last spring, when we uh, transitioned to, to online rather abruptly, transition is a nice word, I think, um, to describe that, um, I was teaching uh, this Modern American Civilization course, which is a 400 level course. We were in um, the uh, section on the Cold War. And so their assessment um, for this part of the Cold War was this one pager. And so you can see that I give a description and background, and then I also have that same list for them. And um, this was um, a particularly um, visual kind of response. Um, and he actually laminated this. So I, I think the student probably thought that I was going to be using it at my kitchen table so that I would always remember him and, and his one pager as I used it as a placemat. But you can see the various elements. You can also see the responses. And on all of these, you'll notice, you know, some students tend to list some write out their responses, and those are the nuances of grading, whatever your requirement is um, for that particular one pager. Let me show you another one. So this is completely digital, um, and this one obviously is hand-drawn um, with a, a pretty good likeness there of uh, Senator Joe McCarthy and Tail Gunner Joe in the middle. And so um, that's in a 400 level class, meeting the requirements, having all of the elements. You'll notice that many of those elements are repeated with the border, the visuals, the claim, the connection. And then finally, and this is what I'm so excited about today because the students just handed these in, they were due at midnight last night. And so in this cross-listed course um, that I'm teaching, I changed a couple of the requirements and you'll notice there on number five um, that I added data to this and I also add and or uh, like a flow chart of policy it, depending on their focus. I have students from all majors in this class, not just environmental resource science, not just history. And so some of them are best served certainly with scientific data to prove their um, the answer to their question to prove their claim. And some of them are better served by thinking about historical aspects or policy aspects. Um, but I kept the argument, the claim, the argument and the connection as well. And so let me show you, um, and I have not graded these, um, but I do wanna show you, hold on just a second here. Um, a couple of these that I received and I'm hoping that, um, let me show you that a little bit larger. So this is one, students for this had to do, 
had to develop their own um, essential question. And as a group, this is the first time I've ever done this project as a group. And so um, I'm synchronous with this class and group project and developing your own essential question. And so you can see this essential question and the elements, the one requirement um, of all students in the group was to have a written portion that they that they added. So like I said, I haven't graded these, but I'm very excited. They look very professional. And um, I am thrilled with the with the quality of work, um, just having glanced at these and, and looking at the kinds of um, elements that they use uh, to answer the, the question. And so that's that's my big excitement for the day. Um, I am thrilled to to uh, be able to grade those at some point and to look at all of them and to also share the share them with the other groups of students in the class as well. Okay, so I want to also uh, just kind of segue into this idea of a curated exhibit and the curated exhibit is um, you know, our world is curated now, whether we like it or not. I do like the playlist, I will say that. Um, but I always share with students like this kind of list, like think of all the things, even just for, you know, for Hulu or for um, Amazon Prime, whatever you happen to be watching, because you watch this and there's a recommendation, or if you, you know, get any kind of digital newspaper, news source, be, you know, do you want us to curate these editorials for you or, you know, whatever it happens to be based on what we're looking at in this online environment. And so I've taken this idea and uh, turned it into kind of thinking about a museum. I love all kinds of museums. And so whether it's an art museum, whether it's natural history, whether it's history museum, whatever it happens to be, I like to have students collect those kinds of things. Again, going back to the documents, going back to the artifacts, um, a mixture of different things, both visual and written, that will show their understanding of a particular topic and answer a question. So I will, this is a shameless plug, but we are a curated campus. And um, I make this connection with my students because we, there is art in every building. And even we, though we're not necessarily on campus to see it, um, we are curated. So I try to share that with them, make that connection before we kind of move on into a scaffolded assignment that I'll show, share with you from my CH203 class. And so um, the first thing, and I use my own slide, I ask them to create what I call a golden record of their American experience using their spheres of influence. So this is my curated exhibit of my uh, spheres of influence, and they create one um, of their own uh, for an introduction of themselves the first week. And then at the end of class, we create um, the Golden Record of American Experience based on NASA's Golden Record, where I remind them of the themes that we have looked at. And then um, I also give them a list of the must includes. And I, I included this today because I'm making a change in this. This historically for me, for the last two and a half years, has the culmination has been a traditional essay, even though I'm asking them to gather artifacts. And I'm changing that this semester so that it will mirror a curated exhibit that's done in a slide style. And so they actually have their artifact, a picture, a photo of their artifact, and then they are able to talk about on the slide next to it so that it is not uh, a formal paper, even though it's a formal exercise in writing. So I'm changing that up a little bit and I'm excited to, to um, see how the feel changes as far as the, the final exam because this will be their final exam and what they bring to that. Okay, I also wanted to show you, um, this is a, Last semester, I taught um, the Native American class, American Indian Relations, that I mentioned uh, was one of my reasons for having pushed me over the edge and away from um, a number of, um, you know, six to eight to 10 to 12 page research papers throughout the semester. And so this was a curated museum exhibit that I asked students to create for this idea of encounters, epidemics, and exchanges. 
And so they came up um, with an exhibit that highlighted those particular topics. I only chose one of these to show you just because there was a written, pretty lengthy written portion with this. So it had um, a, you know, a narrative with it to describe the choices that the students made. But I chose this one just because um, I thought it spoke to the idea of, of kind of dividing these curated kinds of exhibits and um, asks of them like, here's your task and here's the three topics. And, and show, I think this one does a good job of showing how students kind of think through and gather up information as well in these three kinds of the encounters and um, epidemics. So, and I've used a lot of the same classes in this, but this was um, a curated um, American identity exhibit. So the um, placemat that you saw for the Cold War and the picture of McCarthy that you saw um, for the Cold War. Um, this one, the topic was what a long strange trip it's been. You can see the years on that. And so students are creating um, using um, a lot of layers here. So this was a pretty sophisticated ask of them where they had to choose three primary sources for each of the required elements. And so the event, the person and the policy, and they, they had choices within that, they had to have some written and then the others had to come from this like combination of artifact list. And so there's a lot of choice within here. Um, I listened to the grading adventure the, um, that Chris Babbitts did this morning and I was struck by the overlap. He was talking about, um, you know, ch making choices uh, based on, um, not based on your grade, but making choices about what you would do to earn your grade in a class. And I just think this, um, the choices apply here too. Anytime we can give them more choices, I find that students do, uh, do better because they make it their own. Okay, I want to, um, so I have, this is just the first uh, slide in this uh, particular student's list. And I'm hoping uh, that I can show you this. I'm not, yes, I do have it, here it is. And so this is the rest of it. And I wanted to show you these layers because he made a connection between the event, which is Harlem riots of 1964, LBJ in 1964 and Civil Rights Act 1964. He has his written documents that all connect um, the truth about Harlem, Great Society, Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then he also has his three visuals. And then there is a, a written component with that where he justifies each of those and talks about each of the elements of his choice as far as event, person, and policy. Could have come up with a snappier title, but um, this is the student that also made the, the placemat. And so uh, just so you'll know. Um, and you know, when you look at these, you may think, well, that's not, no, they're not perfect. There are always things that could be uh, changed and, and enhanced and, and made better. And you know, that's up to us in the discussion that we have with them to say, this is what you did that was so great. I would have liked to have seen this. And there's a lot of room for really positive feedback. And there's so many elements on this that students seem to take um, that kind of, of feedback in a more positive way because they've had more choices in what they were creating and how they came up with that product. And last but certainly not least is the annotated bibliography. And so I just, I, I want to say a couple things about the annotated bibliography and how I use it. It certainly isn't a visual, it isn't a lovely visual that I, I, I'm going to leave on the screen for any amount of time. But I do think the annotated bibliography has so many different kinds of applications. I use annotated bibliography with my um, history 101 and 102 survey courses, which are, are US survey courses. Um, and I use it in all of my classes to some extent. In the survey courses, I tend to use it as a standalone assessment. In the upper division courses, I tend to use it in tandem with the research paper at the end of the semester that I ask them to produce. And so I think that's the beauty of it. I think source assessment certainly um, is important. 
Michelle, I see you. Are you giving me a five minute warning here? Um, so this is an example of um, an assessment that I use for History 102. And like I said, this gives them choice as far as, as their topic, but it is their single assessment for uh, the World War II era. And you can see that it's fairly narrow. They have four sources um, and they're required to have one of each of those sources. And then um, this is um, just a, a little snapshot of what I have used in the past with the American Indian Relations, their final paper here. And it is, um, I give them a guiding question, they develop the essential question, and then um, the annotated bibliography is created as part of the research paper that they go ahead and write. Michelle, should I stop there? Yeah, I think that's a great place to stop. Okay. So, so do we have, we have 20 minutes before James Lang. Does anyone have any questions for Becky? Okay. Well, if you want to stay a little bit and talk to Becky directly, please feel free to do that. If not, and you want to carry on the conversation, please go to the event page and post that information there. I already posted Becky's slides there. So if you need anything else, please feel free to contact me. Thanks, Becky, for the presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. And you can stop the recording now. I will try to do that.